wanderers from the beginning. We knew every stand of tree for a hundred miles. When the fruits or nuts were ripe, we were there. We followed the herds in their annual migrations. We rejoiced in fresh meat. Through stealth, feint, ambush, and main force assault, a few of us cooperating accomplished what many of us, each hunting alone, could not. We depended on one another. Making it on our own was as ludicrous to imagine as was settling down. Working together, we protected our children from the lions and the hyenas. We taught them the skills they would need and the tools. Then, as now, technology was the key to our survival. When the drought was prolonged or when an unsettling chill lingered in the summer air, our group moved on, sometimes to unknown lands. We sought a better place. And when we couldn't get on with the others in our little nomadic band, we left to find a more friendly bunch somewhere else. We could always begin again. For 99.9% .9 of the time since our species came to be, we were hunters and foragers, wanderers on the savannas and the steppes. There were no border guards then, no customs officials. The frontier was everywhere. We were bounded only by the earth and the ocean and the sky, plus occasional grumpy neighbors. When the climate was congenial though, when the food was plentiful, we were willing to stay put, unadventurous, overweight, careless. In the last 10,000 years, an instant in our long history, we've abandoned the nomadic life. We've domesticated the plants and animals. Why chase the food when you can make it come to you? For all its material advantages, the sedentary life has left us edgy, unfulfilled. Even after 400 generations in villages and cities, we haven't forgotten. The open road still softly calls, like a nearly forgotten song of childhood. We invest far off places with a certain romance. The appeal, I suspect, has been meticulously crafted by natural selection as an essential element in our survival. Long summers, mild winters, rich harvests, plentiful game, none of them lasts forever. It is beyond our powers to predict the future. Catastrophic events have a way of sneaking up on us, of catching us unaware. Your own life, or your bands, or even your species might be owed to a restless few drawn by a craving they can hardly articulate or understand to undiscovered lands and new worlds. Herman Melville in Moby Dick spoke for wanderers in all epochs and meridians. He said, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas. To the ancient Greeks and Romans, the known world comprised Europe and an attenuated Asia and Africa, all surrounded by an impassable world ocean. Travelers might encounter inferior beings called barbarians or superior beings called gods. Every tree had its dryad, every district its legendary hero. But there were not very many gods, at least at first, perhaps only a few dozen. They lived on mountains, under the earth, in the sea, or up there in the sky. They sent messages to people, intervened in human affairs, and interbred with us. As time passed, as the human exploratory capacity hit its stride, there were surprises. Barbarians could be fully as clever as Greeks and Romans. Africa and Asia 
were larger than anyone had guessed. The world ocean was not impassable. There were antipodes. Three new continents existed, had been settled by Asians in ages past, and the news had never reached Europe. Also, the gods were disappointingly hard to find. The first large-scale human migration from the old world to the new happened during the last ice age, about 11,500 years ago, when the growing polar ice caps shallowed the oceans and made it possible to walk on dry land from Siberia to Alaska. A thousand years later, we were in Tierra del Fuego, the southern tip of South America. Long before Columbus, Indonesian Argonauts in outrigger canoes explored the Western Pacific. People from Borneo settled Madagascar. Egyptians and Libyans circumnavigated Africa. And a great fleet of ocean-going junks from Ming Dynasty China crisscrossed the Indian Ocean, established a base in Zanzibar, rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and entered the Atlantic Ocean. In the 15th through 17th centuries, European sailing ships discovered new continents, new at any rate to Europeans, and circumnavigated the planet. In the 18th and 19th centuries, American and Russian explorers, traders, and settlers raced west and east across two vast continents to the Pacific. This zest to explore and exploit, however thoughtless its agents may have been, has clear survival value. It is not restricted to any one nation or ethnic group. It is an endowment that all members of the human species hold in common. Since we first emerged a few million years ago in East Africa, we've meandered our way around the planet. There are now people on every continent and the remotest islands, from pole to pole, from Mount Everest to the Dead Sea, on the ocean bottoms, and even in residence 200 miles up. Humans, like the gods of old, living in the sky. There seems to be nowhere left to explore, at least on the land area of the Earth. Victims of their very success, the explorers now pretty much stay home. Late in the 19th century, Leib Gruber was growing up in Central Europe, in an obscure town in the immense polyglot ancient Austro-Hungarian Empire. His father sold fish when he could, but times were often hard. As a young man, the only honest employment Leib could find was carrying people across the nearby river Bug. The customer, male or female, would mount on Leib's back. In his prized boots, the tools of his trade, he would wade out in a shallow stretch of the river and deliver his passenger to the opposite bank. Sometimes the water reached his waist. There were no bridges here, no ferry boats. Horses might have served the purpose, but they had other uses. 